Good morning and welcome to our services here at Faith Baptist Church. I was just joking with Pastor. I spent most of the day in the wood shop yesterday and I forgot to clean my glasses this morning. So if I say the wrong words this morning, it's because I see through a glass darkly. 363 is we're going to begin this morning. Standing to sing, standing by a purpose true, heeding God's command, dare to be a Daniel. 363. Standing by a purpose true, heeding God's command, honor them the faithful few, all hail to Daniel's band. Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone, dare to have a purpose firm, dare to make it known. Sounds like this might be a new one. Is this a new one? All right, let's do the first stanza again. Standing by a purpose true, heeding God's command. Honor them, the faithful few, all hail to Daniel's band. Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm, dare to make it known. Many mighty men are lost, daring not to stand. Who for God had been a host by joining Daniel's band. Daniel dare to stand alone, dare to have a purpose firm, dare to make it known. Many giants, great and tall, stalking through the land. Headlong to the earth would fall if met by Daniel's band. Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm, dare to make it known. Hold the banner high on to victory grand. Satan and his host defy and shout for Daniel's band. Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm, dare to make it known. Very nice. Over to 410, the banner of the cross. 410. There's a royal banner given for display to the soldiers of the king. As an ensign fair we lift it up today, Some ones we sing. Marching on, marching on, for Christ count everything but loss, and to crown him king, toil and sing, neath the banner of the cross. Though the foe may rage and gather at the flood, let the standard be displayed. And beneath its folds as soldiers up, for the truth be not dismayed. Marching on, marching on, for Christ count everything but loss. And to crown him king, toil and sing, Neath the banner of the cross Over land and sea Wherever men may dwell Make the glorious tidings known Send banner now the story tell While the Lord shall claim his own Marching on, marching on For Christ count everything but loss and to crown him king, toil and sing, neath the banner of the cross. When the glory dawns, tis drawing very near, it is hastening day by day. Then before our king the foe shall disappear, and the cross the world shall sway. Marching on, marching on, for Christ count everything but loss, and to crown him king, toil and sing, 
Neath the banner of the cross. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. <clears throat> Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather at the church house once again. And we thank you, Father, for just allowing us to be here this morning, allowing us to continue to stay healthy as a church family. And Lord, just pray this morning that you would have your way in our hearts and that, Lord, you would be glorified through the preaching and teaching of your word. And we'll thank you and praise you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You're singing very well this morning. Continue with our new song of the month. Here is love wide as an ocean. Here is love wide as the ocean, loving kindness as a flood. When the prince of life are ransom, shed for us his precious blood. Who his love will not remember, who can cease to sing his praise. He can never be forgotten throughout heaven's eternal days. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how glorious is my Savior's love for me. Is my Savior's love for me. On the mount of crucifixion, fountains open deep and wide. Through the flood gates of God's mercy flowed a vast and gracious tide. Grace and love like mighty rivers poured in in from above. And heaven's peace and perfect justice kissed a guilty world in love. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how glorious is my Savior's love for me. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how glorious is my Savior's love for me. Of your fullness you are pouring your great love on me anew. Sure, full and boundless, drawing out my heart to you. You alone will be my glory. In this world I see you have cleansed and sanctified me. You yourself have set me free. Oh, how marvelous! Oh, how glorious! Is my Savior's love for me? Oh, how marvelous, oh, how glorious is my Savior's love to me. Amen. Let's have Michael and Benjamin come. We're going to receive our offering this morning. Remember, right after this morning service, we'll have pizza for everyone downstairs. So please stay and join us for that. And uh, we've got plenty for everyone. So please make your plans to be with us. And then we'll come upstairs around uh, 1230 and have our afternoon service. And we'll be having you on your way home probably by 1.15ish or so. So make, make your plans to be with us. We'll continue this schedule uh, next Sunday right now, for, you know, throughout until further notice. Uh, next Sunday there will be Brown Baggett. So bring your lunch with you and uh, plan to stay with us as well. So let's see, uh, Benjamin, would you ask a blessing? Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you that we could come to church today and uh, tonight, Lord. And uh, just help the singing and the preaching uh, just so well, Lord. And 
Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Wonderful song by Isaac Watts. We're going to sing, Am I a Soldier of the Cross? Would you stand with me? 414 before Pastor comes to preach this morning. Am I a Soldier of the Cross? 414. Am I a soldier of the cross? A follower of the Lamb? And shall I fear to hone his cause? Or blush to speak his name? Must I be carried to the skies On flowery beds of ease? While others fought to win the prize And sailed through bloody seas? Are there no foes for me to face? Must I not phlegm the flood? Is this my world of friend to grace to help me on to God? Should I must fight if I would reign? Increase my courage, Lord. I'll bear the toil and do the pain supported by thy word. Thank you. May be seated. Take your Bibles open to John chapter number 14 this morning. John chapter number 14. John chapter number 14 this morning. I'm going to read the first three verses of this chapter, a familiar passage of Scripture. The Lord Jesus speaking, He says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in Me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. This morning I want to speak to you on a very important subject. Of course, everything in the Bible is important, but this particular subject that I want to talk about this morning with you is it can be looked at as unpleasant, maybe. Um, it's, not a, it's not pleasant to think about this, but it is the Bible. And in truth, most Bible-believing Christians know that it's there in the Bible, but they would like to think it won't happen to anyone they know. And they consequently ignore it. But let me begin this morning with two Bible facts that are absolutely 100% true and are sure to come to pass. First of all, number one, this world is not the Christian's home. Uh, it's not our permanent home, and the reality of this fact will eventually be realized by all who have trusted Christ as their Savior. We are headed for a better place. Amen. The second fact I want to make sure you know about this morning is this. It follows the first one. Everyone who does not know Christ personally in a salvation relationship, according to the Scriptures, will pay a heavy price for that ignorance. Or in their stubborn pride, you choose it. But if you do not know Christ as your Savior this morning, you are headed for a disaster. And I want to make sure you fully understand this morning what that means according to the Bible. I told you it's not a pleasant thing to talk about, but it is Bible and it is part of what we have to realize as Christians. And hopefully it will cause us to be more diligent about sharing our faith. 
You know, the Bible tells us that evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. You ask the question, when is that? It's right now. It's right now. All you must do is look around just a little bit, listen to one news broadcast, and you will find out that evil men and seducers are waxing worse and worse today. Now, I can't speak to you about other countries. I can only speak about what I see happening here in America. But there is, however, a willful ignorance about these two Bible facts that I just mentioned to you that are sure to come to pass. You ask yourself the question, if these are so important, Pastor, why are so many people ignorant of these two things? Well, number one, nobody has told them. Several years ago, I got into a discussion with a godly lady in our church in Virginia, and I made the statement in a lesson that I was teaching. I said, hey, there's people right here in Colonial Heights, Virginia, that do not know Christ as their Savior because no one has ever told them the truth of God's Word with regard to that. After the lesson was over, she came up to me. She said, Pastor, I have to take issue with something you said this morning. And I said, what's that, dear sister? And she said, you said that there's people here in Colonial Heights that have never heard the gospel. And she said, that's not true. I said, it is absolutely true. I said, if you go out and knock on a few doors, you'll find out that there's many people who have never been told the truth about what God requires of us as far as salvation is concerned. I'm talking about people who have never been shown from the Word of God what they need to know in order to be saved. You know, in contrast, there's a willful ignorance, but also there's a preoccupation in our society today among men with many things that are anti-God. Preoccupy, uh, there's a preoccupation. Many folks are focused on so many things that when you get to the root and the core of it, it is anti-God. Environmentalism is one. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't take very kindly to being told what I have to do with my trash. But people tell me, oh, you know, you got to do this. We got to do our part to save the planet and all this other stuff. And I'm like, ah. Put it in the trash, put it in the landfill, and grow grass, and that's all we need to do. And that may not be you, but I'm just kind of picking a little bit. But you know, there's a preoccupation with a lot of things anti-God. Right here in Vermont, did you know that when we send our kids to Christian camp in the summer, if we do, uh, there's a camp right here in Vermont called Witch Camp. They meet every August somewhere in the state of Vermont, they're typically headquartered more down in Addison County, down towards Middlebury, but there's a thing called witch camp, where people who are involved in the Wiccan arts, they gather each year for the mutual benefit and the promoting of witchcraft. It's a big event. Uh, they endeavor to bring, listen, social, moral, and progressive change to Vermont. I'm so thankful for them. All the while they're doing that, they're thumbing their nose at God. You can't serve the God of heaven while at the same time serving the God of this world. It's not possible. And if you think that you can, you are mistaken. This is just the tip of the iceberg here in Vermont. But you know, Vermont was recently voted the least likely or the least godly place in America. That's not a badge of honor that we want in our state. We don't want that to be the case. But, you know, despite all of these crazy activities, God, the creator of the universe, has another plan for Vermonters in mind. And I'm absolutely sure it will come to pass. You know, nothing these people in the witchcraft community or those who are liberal humanists, the secularists of our society, who believe that they can change the world by human action, there's nothing that they can do about this to change God's plan. It is going to come to pass, regardless of what they do. Bill Gates and all of his money and all of his crazy schemes to change the planet will not mean one iota when it comes to God putting forth his plan. Not Al Gore and all the other environmentalists who worship the creation more than the creator. None of these things can change God's plan. It is set in stone in the word of God, and we have to just simply make ourselves to it rather than try to go against it. Because if you go against it, you will lose 
like that. God has prepared a place. We read here a minute ago in John 14. He has prepared a place for us Christians that makes this place, this world that we live in, look like a bad situation. Amen. The best of America, the best of this world, pales in comparison to what God has prepared for you and I who believe the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. John 14, we just read it a minute ago, it says, Let not your heart be troubled. God doesn't want us walking around, wringing our hands, and trying to figure things out on our own. He has told us everything that we need to know. He says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, he said, I would have told you. We serve a God who is honest, he's just, he is uh, equitable in everything he does, and everything he does on our behalf is for our benefit. He says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. John the Beloved was given a glimpse of the things that no other man was privileged to see. And then he was allowed to write about it under the Holy Spirit's inspiration and leadership in the book of Revelation. Turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter number 1. Revelation chapter number 1. This past Wednesday night I talked to you about the rapture of the church and how it is all throughout the Bible. In fact, many uh, types of the rapture have occurred in the Bible. I gave you seven of those on Wednesday night. But the rapture is a true fact. And here in the book of Revelation chapter number 1... We also see here, verse number 3, notice what it says, verse number 3, the Bible says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. This makes things very clear to me. I hope it does to you. John says here in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3, Blessed is he, blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy. What, what does that tell us about this book? It tells us, number one, that we're going to be blessed if we read it. Amen? And secondly, we're also going to be blessed as we understand it. It is meant to be understood. You know, in a lot of Christians' mind, they stay away from Revelation completely. Because they say, well, I just don't understand anything in there, and I don't even want to look at it. I don't want to read it. I don't want to study it. And uh, that is a mistake. Because John tells us very clearly, God intends for us to read this book. And he also intends for us uh, to understand the things that we read. Why in the world would he write it if he didn't want us to know and understand it? It makes it clear Revelation is meant to be read and meant to be understood. Then Revelation chapter 1, look at verse 7. The Bible says, Behold, he cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. There is coming a day, very soon I believe, when every eye shall see Jesus. And then in Romans 14 and verse 11, the Bible says, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. You know, for we Christians, we, we know the rapture is the blessed hope. We talked about that Wednesday night quite a bit. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's the blessed hope for we Christians. We're expecting it. We're looking for the rapture of the church. We want to be out of this place, I hope. We want to be in the place where the Lord would have us to be. We don't want to be in this stinking world any longer than what we have to. But here's the thing. God has left us here because he wants us as the church, as individual Christians, to share the information about the gospel that we have with other folks so that they are not left behind. It's critical that we do this. The rapture is for Christians, those who have trusted Christ as their personal Savior. But for the rest of the lost world, those folks that you know personally, who you've talked to, who you've tried to invite to church, uh, those people who you know that you care about deeply, uh, that are part of your families, some of them immediate family members, some of them distant family members, cousins, uncles, aunts, friends, acquaintances, co-workers, those are the people 
That if they are not reached with the gospel, if they do not trust Christ as their Savior, they are headed for what we're going to talk about today. And just believe me, you don't want them to go through it. Which means we've got to get to work. And we've got to find ways. We've got to pray and we've got to lift these names up to God in prayer. When you go in your prayer closet, you better be lifting these names up and saying, God, do whatever you have to do to break their heart and bring them to the point of repentance so that they too can be saved. The rest of the lost world will not go in the rapture. The rapture is for Christians, the church. Uh, they will, uh, the rest of the lost world will go into what is called the period of tribulation or the seven years of tribulation. That begins right after the rapture takes place. And for those who are not caught away in the rapture of the church, the following things await them. Look at Revelation chapter number 6. Revelation chapter number 6. Revelation chapter number 6. You know, many folks have read Revelation, but they've read right through it, read over it, right past it, without really stopping to consider what some of these things mean. But in Revelation chapter 6, look at verse 1. The Bible says, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, as, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him. He went forth conquering and to conquer. Revelation chapter 6 begins a new chapter for mankind. The church has been removed. The Holy Spirit of God is no longer present on the earth. There's no, uh, uh, no indication of God or whatever. Uh, it's been removed away. And all that is left behind on this earth are those who have rejected Christ and who have said, no, thank you. I don't want anything to do with the Bible. I don't want anything to do with church. You Bible, thump Bible thumpers have your fun, but not, that's not for me. Those folks are going to be left behind and they are going to go through what is called the seven years of tribulation. What is that? It is God's perfect judgment on all unbelievers. His perfect judgment. Why are the lost left behind? Because they would not submit to God's great love for them and his program that he had put in place for all mankind to believe. Believing that Jesus died in their place, that he paid the penalty for their sin debt, that they could not pay, that they might have hope. And then they would enjoy everlasting life with Christ. So they're left behind. They're left to endure the perfect judgment of God. Revelation 6 tells us, look at Revelation 6 verse number 2. It says, I saw and behold a white horse. He that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Remember, this is all going to happen at the beginning of the tribulation. The first half of the tribulation period, seven years, the first three and a half years of it will be a total deception. It'll be a time where uh, the Antichrist will rise to power. That's who you see, by the way, in verse number 2 of Re Revelation 6. This rider on the white horse is not Jesus Christ. He is the Antichrist. He is coming in his place. Did you notice he rides a white horse? Why do you suppose that is? Because the Lord Jesus in Revelation 19 comes on a white horse. And every time the devil tries to do something and his, his, his people do things, they try to deceive Christians, they, de they deceive the world. So it would be fitting for the Antichrist to ride on the same kind of a horse that the Lord would ride on, wouldn't it? But there's a distinct difference. First of all, we find the context of this passage. Second of all, the crowns that this man has. Look at verse number 2. It says there, he had a bow and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering into conquer. First of all, the Lord never talks about dealing with folks with a bow. He uses a sword. Amen. Amen. Second of all, this crown that, he find, that we find here in verse 2 is not the kind of crown that will be in the Lord Jesus. Go to Revelation, you don't go there now, but if you go to Revelation 19, you'll see the crown there is a totally different word. It's crown in English, but if you do a word study, you'll find it's a different crown. A crown reserved for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And uh, he'll try to deceive the people. The Antichrist comes and he'll tell everybody, listen, hey, I've got everything under control. Just trust me. I can fix 
all of mankind's problems. There's nothing I can't fix. After all, everybody loves everybody, don't they? That's what he'll tell everyone. And the majority of the people that are left behind, those that were lost, that go into the tribulation period, they will fall for his deception. And this includes God's people, the Israelites that are left behind. They'll be deceived as well. They'll be so deceived that he'll even tell the Israelites, hey, you know what, go to the, go to the place in Israel in Jerusalem and go ahead and have your temple. Go ahead and do your sacrifices like you were accustomed to way back in the day. That'll be a great thing. Go ahead and do it. It's, oh, it's perfect. He'll be the most charismatic guy the world has ever known. And he will deceive the nations. But at the midpoint of the tribulation, halfway through, everything will change. The Antichrist will go to Jerusalem. He will sit down on the throne that is reserved for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he will then declare himself God. Daniel chapter 11 and 12 tells us this is the abomination of desolation. When the Antichrist takes the rightful place that only Christ should occupy. Remember also, at this point in time, as these events are unfolding, we Christians are not even here. We're gone. We're already with the Lord. This is for everybody who does not know Christ. Now, we have been spared the wrath of Almighty God. This is, this is a, a time of God's condemning judgment on unbelievers. When the first seal is broken in Revelation 6 and verse 1, notice the wording, I saw a lamb open one of the seals and I heard as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, come and see. This first seal represents the peace movements of mankind. All those men around the world who tell me and tell you and tell the world, hey, just listen to me, do what I say, and everything will be peaceful. But there's only one problem. At that point in time, the Spirit of God has been removed. The church is gone. The things that influence society now to at least keep some semblance of good, those things are gone. They're removed. And so think about this. Think about our world today and how corrupt and evil it is and how evil men or sedu uh, seducers are waxing worse and worse with the Spirit of God present. Think what it will be like when the Spirit of God is removed. Man will be left to their own devices. And believe you me, we as Christians do not want anyone we love and care about going through this. Some have confused this writer, like I said earlier, as, the, as Jesus. It's not, it's the Antichrist. The text confirms it. His crown is different. His weapon is different. Uh, but most of the evidence that points to it not being the Lord is found in the following verses. Look at verse number 3. Revelation 6, verse 3, And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to do what? Take peace from the earth. So that perfect peace that the Antichrist promised you, pro not promised you, but promised all the unsaved people, all of a sudden now he's going to say, Hey, that's it. I'm taking it back. It's mine now. You're going to do what I say. And they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Let me just say to you, this is not something that we want anyone that we care about to have to experience. But you mark it down. If we don't reach these folks with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, they are going through this if they're alive when it happens. They won't escape it in death either, by the way. There's other things waiting for them as far as that's concerned. We won't have time to get into that today, but I'm just telling you they won't escape because they die. Verse number uh, 3 says, And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given him that uh, sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. And then num verse number 5, the third seal. When he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And there I beheld a low, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice uh, in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. In the second seal that's been opened, war is on the place of there. Everywhere there's war, everywhere on earth. 
Fighting, people are fighting against each other. There's a constant uh, battle raging. Peace is gone. Men are searching for peace, but there's no peace to be found. And war literally ravages the earth. But here in the third seal, when it is open, famine sets in. You know, every time there's been a major war, famine usually follows. Why is that? Because there's so many things that are destroyed. So many people are preoccupied with fighting war that they don't do the other basic things. Many times their land is ravaged and it's not able to be used for those things to grow food and all the things that mankind needs to survive. And it's oftentimes the result of years of world's war raging everywhere on the planet. After every war, the pieces, however, must be picked up. Man has to get back to business of doing the things that are necessary for mankind to survive. But let me just tell you, it's futile in this particular case. It's not going to work. The fourth seal, Revelation chapter 6, verse 6. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts, a measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, come and see. And so this continues on and on and on. And as we, we remember, we're in the period of tribulation now. But notice that verse 6, after every war, the currency oftentimes loses its value. Back after World War II was over with, you know, it took a wheelbarrow full of money to buy a loaf of bread in Germany. Because why? Because the currency had lost its value. The society of Germany was ravished by war. And many other places suffered because of the, the war that had raged on for so many years. And let me just say, the results of all of this bring death in the, in the wake of human failure to try to take care of things on earth. That's God's business. God has given us a plan to take care of all of these things. And as men, we just simply have to submit to his plan. But you see, there's many folks today, and you know some of them, that have said to you, no, not for me. That's your business. You do that if you want to. You know, the Bible is for weak people, after all. Can I just tell you this morning, that is a tragedy of judgment on their part. God's word will come to pass. Revelation 6 verse 9, the Bible says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. You know, some folks will be saved in the tribulation. They will be saved. Don't tell me, don't ask me how, but some will. The Bible is clear about this. But you know what will happen when they do get saved? They'll have their head chopped off for their witness. That's the price that they'll pay. See, right now in Christianity, we have it easy. See, we can declare anything we want now in this country that we live, at least for now. We can declare anything we want about the Lord Jesus. And we're free to do that because we have some things in place that supposedly, I, last time I checked, have protected our free speech as Christians and as church people. But during the tribulation, the Antichrist will do the ruling. And he will determine what is right to be said and what's not right to be said. And you will pay uh, for your decision to trust Christ with your life. You'll be beheaded. Now, I, let me just clarify one point. I think very few people will be saved in the tribulation period. Because remember, the Spirit of God has been removed. And it will be a very rare thing for somebody to know Christ in the tribulation. But there's reasons that they will. But they'll certainly be beheaded for the decision. Verse number 12, it says, And behold, beheld uh, when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. What in the world? These are literal things, folks. Don't, you, don't let anybody tell you that these are spiritual things that really won't come to pass. These are literal things. Great convulsions that will shake the entire planet when men lose control of the society that is left behind. Anarchy totally reigns. These seal judgments represent God using mankind's own lusts and zest for aggressive power. God allows men to simply destroy themselves. And they will. The only thing that keeps mankind alive today is the grace of God. 
You're here this morning because God gave you the grace to get out of bed. He gave you the mercy to stay alive one more day so that you could come to the church house. Every day that we have is a gift from God. The seventh seal in Revelation chapter 7 is appropriately opened. This seal will not be opened until the 144,000 of the young Jewish men are sealed. And then a number of other things that will take place and other people will be, uh, will be uh, sealed as well. The Bible says that no person can count the number. There'll be so many. But I'm just simply telling you that things are happening fast and furious during the tribulation period. The Lord has a plan for the whole thing. It will be orderly according to him, but it will seem like total chaos to mankind. And it will be a precursor to what the millennial kingdom will be like. If you don't like to worship God now... You're going to be out of place in the millennial kingdom, let me tell you. Because we're going to do a lot of worshiping there. In Revelation chapter 8 and verse 1, the seventh seal is opened. The seventh seal, I'm going quickly. This is not really a Bible study as much as it is giving you some highlights of things that you need to be aware of. But Revelation chapter 8 verse 1 says, When he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of a half an hour. Now let me just ask you this. How long is a half hour? We know it, 30 minutes, right? Have you ever noticed when you're waiting for something? A minute seems like an eternity. When you put something in the microwave and you push one minute and you're hungry, your stomach is growling and you push that one minute and, you're, and you probably open the door at 45 seconds. Come on. We're impatient people. But it says the space of a half hour. That will seem like an eternity to those that are left behind. But that seventh seal will be opened. And the Bible says when that seventh seal is open. Verse number 2, chapter 8 says, I saw seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. The seventh seal introduces the second succession of God's judgments in what we know as the trumpet judgments. And let me just say this, the, the judgments of God begin with the seals, then the middle time is the trumpets, and the last time is the vials or the bowls. And let me just say to you, they get worse as they go. So if you think the first few uh, seal judgments are bad. Wait till you get to the end when the vials or the bowls are being opened. You ain't seen nothing yet. But here in Revelation chapter 8, the Bible says that the angel, he takes an altar having a golden center. And this is verse 3. And he, there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and earthquake. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded and there followed hail, hail and fire mingled with blood. Can you imagine? For those people who are left behind on this planet, on this earth, God sends hail and fire mingled with blood from heaven? I don't even want to think about that. But that's what the Bible tells us will come to pass Surely as I'm standing here this morning, right here in the United States, the Bible says here, he says in verse 8, the second angel sounded and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea and the third part of the sea became blood. Think about that one. In verse number 7, I, I meant to tell you this as well, but uh, one third... Of all the trees and all of the green grass that's in your front lawn this morning, not this morning, normally when it snows not here, but all the green grass that we've come to love when we take the drives across Vermont in the summer and we look out on all the green fields where the grass grows green and springtime brings it, that will be gone, burned up. 
One third of all the trees that are on planet earth will be gone, burned up. Right here in the United States, approximately 100 million people gone in a moment. One third of the entire globe's population will be gone as these trumpets begin to sound. Revelation tells us there are three judgments mentioned. I just talked about that in a minute ago. But they happen in succession, increase in severity. They're released by God and His angels on the lost man of this earth. They begin with the seals, go to the trumpets, and then finish up with the vials or the bowls. The trumpet in the Bible was always used, by the way, as a way to announce something coming. Israel was called to worship by the trumpet. Mankind always knew the trumpet was a sound that caught their attention, called them to attention to know something was getting ready to happen. In Revelation 8, these judgments, these trumpet judgments begin. And at the opening of these things, uh, it's calamity for planet Earth. In verse number 10, the third angel sounds his trumpet. A great star falls from the heaven, causing one-third of all the water on planet Earth to turn bitter. You say to yourself, well, we serve, we know God. He's a loving God, and He would never do anything like this. He's already done it. Go back to the days of Moses. Many of these things that we see happening here, He already did. So don't tell me that he won't do it. He's already done it. Verse 12. And the fourth angel sounded, and a third part of the sun was smitten. A third part of the moon and a third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. How many of you like it when it's daylight? You can get a lot of things done. Well, just keep in mind, if you're here on planet Earth, when the, the judgments begin to fall, you're going to lose four hours right off the bat. The day that's normally 12 hours will go to eight hours. The sun is darkened. The moon is darkened. The stars are darkened. Can you even imagine what that will be like? A third of the sun, moon, and stars. We move into chapter number 9. and verses 1 through 11, we're introduced to a fallen angel. He opens the bottomless pit, releasing smoke. And it darkens the air and the earth so bad. And in addition to the smoke and the darkness of the earth that it causes, it releases locusts on planet earth. Normally locusts eat green things, but here are they are told to go after mankind. The lost of the earth, those men that are left behind, those people that you know and that I know that you care about and I care about that will not trust Christ as their Savior, they're going to be the ones that the locusts are going to go after. Notice what it says, they sting like scorpions. The pain is so intense that men beg God to let them die. Verses 13 through 15, the sixth angel sounds his trumpet and four angels are loosed. They kill another one-third of all men that are alive on planet earth. They're killed by the fire and the smoke and by brimstone. Most likely they die from suffocation. The smoke is so intense. It darkens the sky so badly and the air is so impure to breathe, many will die from suffocation. I don't know about you, but there's a lot of ways I could think about dying, and surely suffocation, I hope, isn't one of them. Where the breath is just gone. Verse 20 and 21 of the same chapter shows us how stubborn man can be. Look there with me. And the rest of men which were, this is chapter 9, which were not killed by these plagues, notice what it says, yet repented not of the works of their hands that they should not worship devils and idols of gold, silver, and brass, and stone, and of wood, which neither can see, nor hear, nor walk. Neither repented they of their murderers, nor their sorceries, nor of their fornications for their 
or their thefts. This goes to show us how evil mankind can be. In spite of all of the things that I've just explained that are going to be happening in quick successions during the tribulation, the second half of the tribulation period, despite of those things, you still have mankind stuck here and you still have some of them shaking their fists at God and saying, I will not change. I will not change. I love my sin too much. I'm going to keep on sinning until I die. God, you can't have me. That's unbelievable to me. But it's true. The Bible tells us it's true. One more thing I want to point out to you in verse number 21. Neither repented they of their murderers, nor of their sorceries. You know the word sorceries there in the Bible? It comes from a Greek word that is very similar to our word pharmacy. Pharma. The Greek word pharma. What does that mean? Here in the Bible, this is talking about drugs. Can I tell you this morning that drugs, you could say right now, almost literally rule our planet. Pharmaceutical companies are making a fortune feeding you drugs that they say will make you better. In some cases it does. But I may just tell you this. There's a lot of drug abuse in our society, and it isn't on the down and outers that are on the street corner. It's all over society. Right here in America, they're trying to tell you that we need to legalize drugs. What's the big deal, they'll tell you. It's a victimless crime. Why in the world can't drugs be okay? I'll tell you why they can't be okay, because they're of the devil. They take a man and they put him in a frame of mind that he would not otherwise be in if he had stayed away. You cannot think clearly as a human being when you're, a, when you're addicted or when you're using drugs. God wants your mind clear and, clear and very focused on what He has to say to you. And when you're a drug user, you can't be in that place. Don't buy into the lies. They're lies of the devil. And right here we see, even when God is pouring out His judgment, mankind say, you're not going to have me, God. I'll not repent. I think by now you get the picture. I probably have told you a lot of things. Many of those things you probably have heard. But I think it's good to remind ourselves once in a while. This is what awaits our loved ones that are not saved. This is not a time we would ever want our loved ones to go through or experience. But these things will surely come to pass. They are literal and they are a Bible fact. So what do we do with what we've heard this morning? Well, let me tell you the first thing we need to do. And I believe what I'm going to say next affects every one of us that are here this morning. We had better stop making excuses for those we love who have so-called made a profession of faith but there's no evidence in their life whatsoever that they are a child of God. See, that's what we do. We say, well, you know, uh, my husband, he doesn't want to come to church, but, you know, he made a profession of faith, you know, 635 years ago. Or whatever it was. He made a profession of faith. But every other day of the week, every other uh, hour of the day, every minute of the day, he lives like the devil. Wants nothing to do with God. Wants nothing to do with God's word. The church, Christians, or anything that has God anywhere in the middle of it. He wants nothing to do with it. But yet he made a profession of faith. Don't you deceive yourselves. And don't you let them deceive themselves. Profession of faith will not save anyone. When you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ with your heart and you understand what He did for you according to the Scriptures, and you have placed your faith and trust, and immediately you are changed. You are, you are uh, regenerated. You're a new man. Like 2 Corinthians, you're a new man in Christ. Behold, all things are passed away. All things are become new. And you have a new direction in life, and you love the Lord, and you want to get every part of Him that you can. 
Those folks who've made professions of faith, they're, they're playing church many times. Never really showing a lasting fruit in their lives. Never had any fruit in their life in many cases. These are people that we care about. These are people that we love. And we're letting them sit in their sin because after all, they made a profession of faith. We better start lifting their names to the throne of grace. We better start lifting their names. We better be praying diligently that God would break their hard hearts and bring them to repentance. Time is short. This earth is not our permanent home. We have a mansion waiting for us as Christians. And just let me say this, we want everyone that we care about to enjoy a mansion for themselves as well. Don't let these things that I've told you this morning just slip into oblivion. Burn them deep in your heart and understand this is what awaits every person who does not know Christ as their Savior. Should the trumpet sound today and this Christians in the church should rise and be gone from this place and they're left behind, at that very moment it's too Late. I didn't tell you one more thing. Those people that I said may possibly off chance get an opportunity to be saved in the tribulation. If they have heard the gospel in this day and age. If you've witnessed to them and you've told them what they need to know to be saved. And they've pushed you away. They're never going to be saved in the tribulation period. That's only for those who've never ever heard the gospel. To intervene in those who've been playing with the things of God is our responsibility. And we better take it seriously. Otherwise, they're headed for what I talked about. I didn't even cover the bowl or the vile judgments. And they're even worse. But I think you get the picture. God will save our loved ones. God will save the people that we care about on this earth. But we must do our part to get them the truth and be praying for them every day that God would save them. And I believe if we'll do that, He will if we will. We must get serious about the things that we've heard today before it's eternally too late. Let's stand for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we, Lord, we've shared from your word this morning some things that are hard to hear. But Lord, every one of us knows full well that they're true. If we believe the Bible, we cannot not believe these things. And Father, you've put them there for our admonition. So that we'll be more diligent about leading our loved ones to Christ. Help us, Father, I pray this morning to be diligent about our loved ones. Because, Father, we don't want any of them to go through these things. But like we said in the beginning, they will if we don't do our part. Help us this morning as we pray in our invitation time. Help us, Father, to be mindful of your plan and to be working your plan the way we ought. And help us to not be so distracted by so many things that do not mean anything. Help us as we pray in Jesus' name.